we want to continue talking about the prayer of petition. You may remember one time after Jesus was done praying, the disciples said this, Lord, teach us to pray. And I believe that is a heart cry for every Christian. Lord, teach us to pray. And I would say this, Lord, teach us to pray to see results. Now, I want some feedback if you could. We want to pray to see results. We want to see breakthrough in our lives. And we know this, there are different kinds or types of prayer. Now, a handyman has many tools at his disposal. And he needs to know what tool he needs for a particular time. It may be a hammer, a screwdriver, a plunger, a wrench, a staple gun, or if all else fails, duct tape, right? And so the reality is this. He knows what he needs at the particular time. So it is with a prayer warrior. We have many tools in our prayer arsenal, but we need to know which tool to use and what kind of prayer to pray in any given situation. Perry Stone said this, just as there are 11 different individual types of spices and ingredients in the temple incense, the New Testament identifies at least 11 different types of prayer. Now, the Bible says that our prayers come before God as incense. Psalm 141, verse 2, let my prayer be accepted as sweet-smelling incense in your presence. So I want to remind you, the Scripture talks about all kinds or every kind of prayer. I want to briefly remind you of these. There is the prayer of consecration, where we say, God, I consecrate myself to do your will, not my will, but yours be done. Then there is that prayer of thanksgiving and praise and worship where we say, God, I'm not asking you for anything. I just want to love you. I just want to bless you and worship you. Then there is the prayer of repentance. Lord, forgive me for sins of omission, sins of commission, what I may have done or failed to do. God, I repent. There is the prayer of committal. Lord, I take every care, every burden, every anxiety, and I cast it, I commit it unto you. How many of you know we are to leave the prayer room not with the burdens of prayer, but with the peace of our God? Now, there's the prayer of petition. We're talking about that here. Then there is the prayer of intercession. That is a selfless prayer because you're not praying for your needs, your wants. You are praying for somebody else. And God's called us to be doing that. Then there is that prayer of agreement or united prayer. Of two of you on earth will agree, it shall be done. There's also the prayer of deliverance. How many of you know we still have demons today? They don't just live in a third world country. They're all around the world. You say, well, you know what? We don't have those today. Listen, Jesus dealt with demons they're still in the earth until they're bound after this dispensation, but we have authority over them. So there is that prayer of deliverance. Then there's the prayer of binding and loosing. The Bible says whatever you bind will be bound. Whatever you loose will be loosed. We'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of minutes. Then there is praying in the Spirit or in other tongues. Listen to me. You should be praying in your prayer language every day. You must not have heard me. You should be praying in your prayer language every day. Why have a tool at your disposal you don't use? It is something God gives you to empower you to live the Christian life. And then lastly, the prayer of declaration or proclamation. I speak to the mountain and command it to be gone. But I want to remind you, it's not just about asking God for things. Prayer is first and foremost fellowship with the Lord. Lord, I love you. I just want to fellowship with you. I know that there are some very difficult things happening in the world, and we need to be praying for them. Things like Ukraine, things like 
the economy, our leaders. But in the midst of it, there are those times of intimate fellowship with the Lord. Remember Adam and Eve walked and talked with God in the cool of the day? We're still called to walk and talk with him in the cool of the day. Pastor Mark, when is the cool of the day? Whenever it works for you. It could be 8 in the morning, 8 at night, 1 in the morning, whenever there's that time of peace where you and the Lord can fellowship. And we want to talk some more about the prayer of petition. It is found in the Old Testament and in the New. For example, 1 Samuel 1.27, this is Hannah, and it says, For this child I, Hannah, prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition, which I asked of him. So her petition was this, Lord, I, I seem to be childless. I need a child. Eli blessed her, and she conceived, and that son's name was Samuel, one of the great prophets of the Old Testament. But notice she prayed a prayer of petition. Another great intercessor was Daniel. And he could be found petitioning the Lord three times daily. Even though the king would not allow him to do this, he still opened up his window and prayed towards Jerusalem three times a day. And the Bible says in Daniel 6, 11, then these men, these were his enemies, went as a group and found Daniel petitioning and imploring his God. Now that's just two examples. Hannah and Daniel petitioning the Lord. There's another one in the New Testament we all know. First of all, 1 Timothy 2.1, I urge that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and and thanksgiving be made for everyone. Now notice that word petitions. Some of your translations use the word supplications. Listen to me. Supplications and petitions are the same word in the Greek language. They are interchangeable. And so we can see that petitions are found in the Old Testament, in the New Testament. But what is exactly a petition? Now, one, the, one Greek scholar says it's supplication, prayer, or entreaty. Now, that's a little bit blind. But I want to mention another one. I like this. Praying for a specific felt need. How many of you have some felt needs, some things I, just, I feel I really need a miracle, a healing, finances, freedom, whatever it is? It says again, praying for a specific felt need arising out of a deep personal need. So this is actually praying for something that is a burden, a, a need, a desire in your personal life. One Greek scholar said it refers to prayer for one's own personal needs. How many of you here have some kind of need in your life? Obviously, every one of us. It's great to have the prayer team praying with you, but listen to me, they should not be doing your praying for you. It is important for you to learn how to pray this prayer of petition. Now, the word petition in the dictionary means an earnest request something asked or requested, and we're going to talk more about this next week, or a formal written request. And what I'm, I've been learning the last couple of years on major areas, learning the importance of writing that out, even signing it like a legal document, not so much on God's portion because he needs this, but for my portion so that I can stand, I can stand on the scriptures and say this is what we're believing for. So we'll talk more about that next week. But I want you to turn to the foundational verse for the prayer of petition, 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And I'm going to ask you, look it up on the screen or look it up in your Bible, but you need to know this. It's so important. Notice what it says. Now this is the, talk to me now, what's the next word? Confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Now, this is such, so foundational. I want you to notice three phrases. 
The first one is the confidence. You may want to underline that. The second one is we know, and then again, we know. This is the confidence that we have in him. We know that he hears us, and we know we have the petitions that we desire. Now, notice that word confidence. We can petition the Lord with confidence, listen to me, when we know what his word promises. Now, when I was a young man at a Christian school, it was a good Christian school, but here was the prayer that people, the kids prayed all the time. It's, I have an unspoken request. And all the kids, unspoken, unspoken, unspoken. How can you stand with something for an unspoken request? You don't know what it is. And so it's not, we don't want an unspoken request. We want to say, Lord, this is what your word says, and I want to stand upon that. Notice again that verse, this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. How many of you know we need God to hear us? Therefore, we need to pray his will. Well, Pastor Mark, how in the world would I know his will? His word is his will. Someone put it this way. God's word is his part of our prayer life. Say that with me. God's word is his part of our prayer life. So we need to base our prayers on the known will of God. Don't we call this the last will and testament? So God's word is his will. And we mentioned these last week that God's word is salvation because the Bible says he'd have all men to be saved. It is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. It is healing, provision, victory, whole relationships. All of these things are his will, even divine protection, So we can stand upon those in a prayer of petition. Now, a very interesting verse that you may know well, Isaiah 55, 11. God is speaking. He says this, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void. That word void means empty or without fruit. It shall not return to me void but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Now notice what it says. So shall my word be that goes forth. It shall not return to me void. Listen closely. We return God's word to him by speaking the word out loud. God has spoken his word, and we return his word to him. When we return his word to him, it does not return empty or without fruit. Now, we won't pray amiss when we're praying the word of God. I want to give you another example. I did this last week of someone praying amiss. I don't believe they meant to do this. I don't believe their heart was wrong. But I read one time there was a woman, and the church was having a prayer meeting, and in the midst of that, She was praying against their friend's prosperity so that the family could be in church more. You see, they had began a new business, and because of that, all of their time was away from church. They used to be at church two or three times a week. Now they weren't. And so here's what she was praying, and the pastor heard this. God, I bind Brother Dyer to go broke, to lose everything so they'll have to close down their business God, what I bind on earth is bound in heaven. And the pastor said, why are you praying that prayer? Well, pastor, they haven't been at church for months. All they ever do is work, and I'm praying to get them back into church. He said, that's not the way to do it. He said, instead, pray for your friends to prosper so they can hire additional staff and still be involved in church like they used to. You see, we're not called to bind people. We're called to bless people. And you cannot bind what God hasn't bound. God doesn't speak brokenness, poverty, or lack over you. He speaks blessing and increase and provision. So we want to bind the devil 
but we want to loose the power of God. If someone is struggling, don't curse them. Anyone can do that. Bless them in the name of Jesus. But that's praying amiss. When we pray the prayer of petition, we should be saying on a regular basis, Father, your word says. Father, your word says. Because if we know his will, he hears us. So we know his will by knowing his word. So we're taking his word and returning it back to him. That keeps us praying properly and biblically and effectively. Now, I love what Rod Parsley said. God never forgets, but he loves to be reminded. We said, God, I remind you of what your word says. Now, we don't remind him because he forgot it. We remind him to say, God, this is what you said. We stand upon that. Over the years of pastoring, we've had some great seasons, some very dark seasons. And many a time I have awoken at 2 or 3 in the morning not being able to sleep because of anxiousness or turmoil or being concerned about things. And sometimes I'll just get up in the middle of the night and I'll just say, God, we've got to have a heart-to-heart here. You're not to blame, but we need some breakthrough." And I'll say, God, I remind you of what you've said in your word. I remind you of what you've said prophetically. I hold on to this. I do not give up. I stand. One thing I've determined, I'll never probably have my face on Charisma Magazine, and that's totally fine. But I will be faithful to the end. I will do the, do the will of God all of my days. I will preach another 30 years minimum because God has called me, and I will finish strong. So I will not quit, I will not give up, and I've seen God over and over and over again be faithful. But how many of you know he can be an 1159 God? But he's always faithful. Now, if we are honest with ourselves, and I'll be honest with me, many times as we're praying, we have feelings of inadequacy or inferiority. Would anyone agree with that? Because the enemy reminds you, who do you think you are? Why would God hear your prayers? I remember what you said to Uncle Louie last week. I remember how you responded to Sister Sally the other day. God isn't going to listen. We should come into God's presence realizing that we have absolute right standing with God. Not based on what we've done, but based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. Here's what the Bible says. Hebrews 4, 16, let us come boldly to the throne of grace. Why can we come boldly? Because we come in His grace. And listen to this verse. Psalm 34, 15, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their cry. How many of you want God's eyes on you? How many of you want him to be open to your cry? The key is this, you need to be righteous. Well, Pastor Mark, I'm trying to be righteous. Listen to me, I've got some good news for you. You don't have to try to be righteous. God gave you his righteousness. He who knew no sin was made to be sin for us, that we might be made, not earn, not deserve, not work for, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. It's called the divine exchange. You gave Him your shame, your inferiority, your your lack, your sin, You gave it to him. He said, I give you my righteousness. We're not worthy, but he's made us worthy. Let us come boldly. Not because you're something, because he's something, and he gave you his righteousness. You say, I wish I could be righteous, Pastor Mark, then God would hear me. I've got good. 
news, you were born again, and because of that, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. Now, when you preach on the importance of speaking the word of God, there are several great examples, but one of my favorite ones is in a passage you would never expect. It is in the book of Jonah. Now, remember Jonah was a prophet called to deliver a message to a city called Nineveh. And you need to understand something about Nineveh. It was an enemy nation, and they were in the process of exterminating his own people, Israel. So God's telling him, go to your enemies that want to destroy you and tell them that God wants to do something great there if they will repent. He says, I'm not doing that. I don't want them to be saved. I don't want them to be delivered. I want them destroyed. I'm out of here. So he did not go to Nineveh. Instead, he went to Tarshish. He got on a boat. He said, I'm going the other way. You remember the story. There was a great storm that arose, and even the heathen sailors that were there said, well, we've got to do something. This must be from God. And they they did different things to find out that Jonah was the reason this storm arose. So they, they did what heathen would do. You're the problem, goodbye. They took him and they threw him over. He was swallowed by a great fish. We call it Jonah and the whale. We don't know whether it was a whale. It could have been. It was just a really big fish. You say, do you believe that really happened? Jesus did because he talked about Noah. So I believe that he was swallowed by a fish. Now, you think about being in a fish's belly. Smelly, food, seaweed, gastric juices. But in the midst of that, he begins to pray. Now, listen to me. There's a bit of Jonah in all of us. There are only two roads in the Christian life. One road leads to Nineveh, the other to Tarshish. One road is the will of God. The other is disobedience to the will of God. Are you going to Nineveh or are you on your way to Tarshish? Are you striving to walk in obedience to the will of God or are you running from the Lord? The answer will determine whether you're going up or down in your spiritual life. Now, I heard a great quote, and I love this. Some people change their ways when they see the light. Others change their ways when they feel the heat. Good preaching, Pastor. I'm going to say that again. Some people change their ways when they see the light, but others change when they feel the heat. Jonah saw the light. But he didn't want to do it. He ran. But in the belly of a fish, he felt the heat. He knew he was toast. So he began to cry out to God, repent, and say, Lord, I'll do your will. So we come to Jonah chapter 2 and verse 1, and it says this. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Now, can you imagine this? There's a lot of places I've prayed. I never want to pray out of a fish's belly. And he said, I cried out out to the Lord because of my, what's the next word? Affliction, and he answered me. Now notice the word affliction. Psalm 119.67 says this, I was afflicted, or before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. I did my own thing. But now, after the affliction, I keep your word. Now, I want to say something about that. According to the New Testament revelation that I see, affliction is not sent by God. It's sent by the devil. But God can still use it to turn us back to him. I'm going to say that one again. According to the New Testament revelation I see, Affliction is not sent by God, but still used to draw people back to him. And that is exactly what happened in Jonah's situation. 
Now, what's amazing to me is Jonah was running from God because he did not want to give the word of the Lord. He finds himself in this fish's belly, and he says, it's about time for a prayer meeting. And so he begins to pray to the Lord. And he didn't have a Bible there. He didn't have scrolls there. But he, think about this, he begins to pray all of these scriptures that came out of his heart. Listen, the time to get the word in your heart is before the trials. So in the midst of the trials, they can begin to bubble forth and you can begin to declare the word of God. And it's interesting, Jonah did not use one original thought or request. Nothing original, not that that's wrong, but what did he do? He prayed God's word. He prayed the scriptures. Listen to this. Eight times in these few verses, he quoted from the book of Psalms. Eight times. I believe we have a slide that is going to show that to you. We're going to show you Jonah's prayer, and with that, we're going to show the Psalms as well. He prayed eight different times, and each of those was right out of the book of, uh, uh, book of Psalms. So that shows me. Take a look at that. Very interesting. In the midst of his praying, in the midst of the gastric juices, the smell, all of the stuff he was dealing with, the word of God began to come forth. Then he declared psalm after psalm after psalm after psalm. Eight different times. Now listen, if you can put the devil on the run in the Old Testament with the book of Psalms, how much more with the complete canon of Scripture now? All 66 books. And so in the midst of that, he's crying out to God, and here's what the Bible says. Jonah 2, verses 9 and 10. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows. He's basically saying, Lord, I'm praying, and I'm going to fulfill that vow. I said no to you. I now say yes to you. I'm going to go to Nineveh. I'm going to do the will of God. And you know the story. He went to Nineveh. He gave them a word of repentance. They believed it. They repented. And God held or withheld his judgment from Nineveh. But it says this, I will offer praises to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows. For salvation or deliverance comes from the Lord alone. And then what's the next word there? Then. Why then? After he repented, after he prayed the word of God, then the Bible says the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah onto the beach. It wasn't a coincidence when he humbled himself, when he began to pray the word of God and say, Lord, I'll do your will, up he came. Now it's interesting, Jonah had been disobedient, the fish was only obedient. But notice, even Jonah understood the prayer of petition. I'm not saying that your prayer should be just quoting scriptures. I believe we should be fellowshipping with the Lord. I believe we should be praying in our prayer language, worshiping Him, listening to Him. Remember this, He is the one, is the, the Holy Spirit is the helper in prayer. So we need to let Him lead and we follow. But with everything we do, it always goes back to, Lord, your word says. Because when we do, we have confidence, and we know, we know that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. Our God is a faithful God. He is so good. And I believe in this season God wants his people to say, at times, and let me just say this, at times everyone needs someone to pray for. If you never need anyone to pray for you, there's something wrong. The older I get, the more I am grateful for the prayers of the saints. But I've been all over the world. There are times, I, you know, when I used to go to India, Africa, other places, this was before cell phones. I would get on the plane, and once I left America, uh, St Pastor Stephanie would not hear from me for two weeks. 
Uh, there were no emails. I remember when we first began to go to Uganda, no cell service, and then all of a sudden, I had a BlackBerry at the time. There's 200 messages, but I mean, you never knew whether you had internet or not. And I'd have to say, Lord, I can't have anyone pray for me. I take a hold of you. I want to say this. Some of you are saying, Pastor Mark, you don't know my past. I don't. But you know what? God forgives. God cleanses. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman avails much. You know what? You are righteous. You have the righteousness of God in him. So you need to remind yourself of that. And you need to remind the devil of that. Because what he brings is, you're not worthy, you have shame, you should have guilt. Say, Jesus forgave me, he cleansed me, and I have right standing with God. We are standing on this, on this prophetic word, a miracle a month. A miracle a month. Some of those will be very large, some of those will be just big to you. But let's believe our God together. And one other prophetic word that I love, when the world is saying, worst of times, worst of times, those that are walking in faith will say, best of times, best of times. Let's stand.